I'm delighted to be joined by my friend Iski Britton this evening. Uh, we're going to have a wide-ranging conversation around our kitchen tables. And I have to say, this is probably, although it's only the second uh, conversation I've been privileged to host, is probably going to be the most romantic kitchen table ever, because um, Iski is in a caravan on the far west. Um, Ireland uh, being super cool and I said have you got a drink to accompany your kitchen table she said I have a beer cooling in the stream outside <laughs> I cannot possibly compete with that um, as those of you who know the stories of uh, uh, Eden's progress through the, the years will know that the kitchen table has got a, a, a very vivid symbolism for us because it's a, a an equaling force it's a place where we always think uh, the conversation is fulsome. Uh, the wilder extremes of our imaginations are often let go. And we often say that by candlelight, although tonight we have no candlelight, uh, people maybe speak a little bit more truthfully about what their ambitions and aspirations might be. So the kitchen table conversations have come to be, uh, if you like, the byword of what we're going to be doing with our webinars. Now, Iski had a small a small introduction just now. And, uh, she is famous uh, throughout the world of surfing for being a real champion for uh, for the the art and craft and also the incredible daring do of surfing, ambassador for women's surfing. She's a, 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 a researcher uh, into the environment and health and uh, the liquid health that is her particular forte we will be exploring today. So I thought perhaps the very first and most obvious question to start with is, is uh, we're living in a time of plague. Um, <laughs> And obviously, this plague has meant that an awful lot of people are either locked in places where they can't have nature or they're in a place where they can, as a bit of a get out into nature. And I thought this might well play very well into your thoughts about making uh, the notion of the environment and health a muscular reality rather than feeling a bit hippy-dippy. Fight. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um I really think this time has thrown into just stark reality how connected we are to the world around us. Um, and it's just been really interesting to observe. I mean, for me, my research focus, as you mentioned, it's in the area of what's been termed blue health or oceans and human health. And in the last in the 10 years or so, in, at least in the West, in, in Western society, uh, we're just beginning to realize how much access and experience of healthy healthy environments, and in particular, um, water environments and being by the sea can directly enhance and restore, you know, health and well-being. Um, and in, in, in this age of, well, you know, facing, we're really, I think what we also realize with pandemic and lockdown and, and we're going to increasingly encounter is this sort of growing and heightened psychological distress coming from, from this and then coming out of the pandemic to realize, oh, we're still in the midst of climate breakdown. Uh, there's, you know, civil rights protests happening and mass extinction hasn't slowed down. And we have no clue of the impact of, of those things or of what um, uh, another favorite writer of mine, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who we've spoken about called species loneliness. Um, so we don't know the imp impact that will have on the human psyche, especially a human psyche that's already distressed. Um, it's just only that it can't be a good, good outcome. But what we've realized from what's happened right now is that people over the world um, have referred to, you know, for example, noticing for the first time in years or maybe since their childhood uh, birdsong. And so I guess we just hadn't noticed or hadn't even noticed how numb and disconnected we'd become, you know, to begin to start noticing these everyday things that were perhaps always there that were now heightened because we took a moment to pause uh, and we gave breathing space to everything else <laughs> around us. And so that gets to this kind of paradox, isn't it, of, of how that like within nature, um, within these living systems that we're a part of, lies our greatest hope for our own healing and restoration. And actually, I think that's what excites me. I think there's huge potential uh, coming out of this, depending on how we look at it and what we do with it next. Your, your background, uh, I mean, I ought to just say uh, that uh, I have recently read the draft of your absolutely stunning book, Saltwater in My Blood. And it took me... Uh, into places I'd never been before or thought of before. And you describe absolutely brilliantly 
your relationship with the sea, which begins in the earliest days. And your your dad um, and your mum are such powerful uh, mm. characters in the book, not, not only as parents, but also their life seem to really rub off on you. And you took it, you took it absolutely to heart. Could you just give us a, a, a brief canter through your early days and, and your love of, of the sea? Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, such a good place to begin. Um, it's a, yeah, so basically everything I'll be talking about will really highlight this bias and passion I have towards the ocean. But then like, where did it come from and, and why, why, um, why the sea and why surfing for me? I grew up on the west, northwest coast in Donegal in Ireland. Um, and since the age of four, I've been standing on a surfboard thanks to both my parents passing on their love of the sea. So having this kind of already generational connection um, with the sea through something like surfing, which is, um, I mean, okay, what is surfing to me? It's been my way to really express I think especially as a, as a young kid and a girl growing up somewhere like Donegal and being so isolated to really express myself in the world and connect with that sense of, of who I am, as well as a sense of wonder of that environment. Um, and even, you know, how, recognizing how much my identity has been shaped by the sea. And I think the same goes for all humans, which I can talk about in a moment. But my name, so my, my parents even naming me after one of their favorite waves on the west coast of Ireland, Eski. And then the story gets richer because Eski comes from the Gaelic for fish. Um, and it, that's connected to the you know, Salmon River flows out there that actually, as it enters the sea, creates this um, wave. Um, and in, in Irish mythology, there's this wonderful uh, story about the Salmon of Knowledge called Radon Fasa, or Salmon of Wisdom. So, I mean, tied up in all of that for me is this reminder of... Um, yeah, just, just how connected we are with the sea, but also that there was a time when we kind of understood or recognized the wisdom of um, just paying more attention to to the world around us, to the living more than human world, to to the salmon and understanding of what is what could we learn from it. Um, and so I think that's always fueled my curiosity as well. It's like, what can we learn from um that that living world around us and just you know hence the fascination with with rock pooling as as a kid <laughs> as you're learning so much from from all these different species so now what point did you realize you had more than a hobbyist gift uh, as being a surfer um Oh, wow. I think I always resented anyone who said, oh, that's a really nice hobby you have. It seems like a reductionist. I mean, I can't live without it. It may as well be the air I breathe. Um, I don't know. I guess it's an, maybe it's an unusual thing, is it, to have such a burning passion from such an early age of you know, recognizing that it's this place I can go to and be fully myself that's always I mean the luck of where I live as well that was always present for me um and I don't think it was almost it wasn't for me it wasn't really a form of escapism as such but it was more I felt more at home so I've always felt more at home in water than on land um and that transition's always excited me knowing that something's going to change when I put my wetsuit on and cross the threshold from from the shore into the sea and, and I obviously write about uh, that experience in the book as well. And I mean, it's something that a lot of, um, not a lot, but something, another favorite writer of mine, Rachel Carson, actually writes a lot about too, which is um, that connection to something that's alive, that's so much bigger than us and that has, but also has this rhythm, you know, so like that as a surfer, just being really connected with that from an early age of the tides and cycles and um, how that has actually influenced how how I'd like to live and work, but not maybe always how I do. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And did you find, um, I remember when we first met, we, we, we were talking, in fact, about the project we'll come on to later in Derry, London Derry, but you laughed at me when I was talking about whether you ever surfed with people from the north and, um, and you just roared with laughter to say that actually surfers didn't recognize any county line, so to speak, and that there was actually a kind of fellowship or a tribal thing because you were all um, passionate about your surfing. And I, I think that's one of the things I've noticed about surfers. It's actually, it's more important 
is more important than anything. You know, I, I know from my youngest boy, he 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 feels like the it's like the call of the wild. And in your book, I, was, I could hear that sort of howling in the background. Because you talk a little bit about that culture, which is I get. I, I'm just trying to. I can't even think what years this would be, but where you had young people from north and south saying, uh, you know, so that for a game of darts, and were actually traveling to the really great breaks together and having a, a sort of tribal time, which was devoid of uh, sectarian or, or, or mm. boundaries. Yeah, I guess they were the early seeds planted in, in my life for recognizing that, you know, surfing or this connection to the sea in a playful way uh, could help help us, I suppose, better understand and celebrate our differences or transcend them all together. Um, and in surfing, it's interesting because it becomes that obsession. It's like called the good addiction, but it still has all those addictive tendencies <laughs> that, you, you know, you get the withdrawal symptoms if you don't get your, your surfing fix um, or knowing if I can just get myself into the sea, I'll be able to hit reset um, for whatever comes next. And then with, when I was growing up, so Donegal's on the border of Northern Ireland and um, and my mother went to university in, in Ulster and in Coleraine. And then dad as well during the, the 70s was kind of the, when surfing was really beginning to get going in Ireland, I suppose, early days. And there was a real tight knit crew of surfers in, in Port Rush in the Antrim coast. Um, and then my dad and his brothers and some others from the, you know, the south of Ireland, and they'd all get together, pile into a VW van and do the whole trek through Europe and down into Morocco um, and back. And that was, so to put that in context, that was also at the height of the so-called uh, troubles in Northern Ireland. So the conflict when, you know, sectarian violence was at its um, at its height. Um, and then there were this, you know, I asked dad about it and he said, we well, just never even really talked about it. It was all, all about the surf, you know, um, so it's, yeah, it's fascinating no, that's, that's, that, that, uh, that is amazing as, as a non-surfer myself I was um, I was fascinated by some of the things and excuse me if I don't look at you as I look down at my notes because there's bits that really struck me which I want you to perhaps reflect on um, you talk about uh, there is only non-dual choiceless awareness volatile fluid unpredictable that was how you viewed the ocean and you then said something which I thought was amazing, which I'd also like to reflect on it, which is the sea is honest. It is truth without discrimination. It may be vicious. It may be calm, but it is always honest about how it is. It's a bit like you have a complete emotional relationship with your ocean. Yeah. That's a, that's a good way of, I mean, that's what drives me, right? That question of how do we better understand a relationship with the sea in order to restore that emotional connection. I just can't fathom not having that in my life. <laughs> and I suppose it's the reality for most people is that the ocean is very much out of sight, out of mind. You know, we've done such a good job at separating it from our lives. Um as, as humans and in, in Western society, and yet it just is relevant to every aspect of life. Uh, but getting to that, yeah, what I'm talking about there, um, I, I guess when I think about it as well, what is it about the pull of it for me? And it's surfing is like this dance between an interplay of both power and vulnerability. So the power comes from being so immersed in, um, you know, in an environment that's just not natural for most humans, you know, it's like we have to hold our breath <laughs> when we're underwater and uh, we can't breathe. And, uh, but that also heightens this sense of, um, I think, total presence in our bodies. It's so visceral uh, and it energizes us because it's so powerful and we're absolutely, you know, it's, um, it's beyond our control and everything in our society is about more the, the narrative of dominance and control over the natural environment and you put someone in the sea with a surfboard or, or in in waves um it's a very you know you realize very quickly the the kind of idiocy of that but at the same time alongside with that comes this vulnerability as well because we're so immersed in it and um we have to basically surrender that will to want to control. Um, and, you know, by our very presence in the moment, it also makes us vulnerable. I think there's an, another thing we talked about as well, how I have that line about we're permeable. This I just fascinated by the sense of, I guess a lot of my work is also around how do we 
break down that sense of separation. And so I love the idea that our actual bodies are permeable, you know, our, our skin. Um, it's, it's, you know, and as a surfer, that's a very real experience because you just, you get tossed and tumbled by a wave and you get, you know, water everywhere. And, you know, even the wind and cold water, um, it starts to form this, you know, um, adaptation in, in our ear, you know, in a surfer's ear where the bone grows over to try to protect the ear canal, um, which is not a good thing long term. <laughs> but, you know, there, so all of those things kind of for me just evidence and highlight actually how interconnected uh, the interrelationship w- between us and our environment, but also like water and why are we drawn to it? You know, as, as, as humans, there's always been that sense of, a pull or even drawing inspiration from it um, or this longing for it if we're away from it for too long. And and, I mean, that's throughout human history, Um, which I don't think is surprising at all because we're actually bodies of water and you think about it. um, And we still have that in our DNA from when all life kind of came ashore a a billion or so years ago, whatever it was. Does that make you wonder at how, our society today has down, downplayed the effect of the environment on ourselves. When in fact, what you just said, you know, we a large percentage of us is water. You know, the tides, the pull of the moon, gravity, all of it, the electromagnetics. It must affect us, and yet it has been until recently it has mm. been uh, described as being. Uh, alternative you know quotes unquote alternative to be interested in these things uh, it's actually I, I i perceive from your conversation that it's actually starting to go from being alternative in a hippie sense to actually representing some serious alternatives uh in terms of understanding the human psyche and sense of belonging and rootedness and all those good things um mm. i'm gonna not let you even answer that for a moment because there's something uh, I want to take you back to there's only one, uh, the non-dual choiceless awareness bit, because when you described that to me, you were describing, you it, it, to me as a musician and not a surfer, it felt incredibly musical about the moment when you're playing, if you like, someone else's song where you're doing comp- competitive surfing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that phrase about there is only non-dual choiceless awareness is the moment when you let go of being an actor and people looking at what you're doing according to certain standards. And it's just suddenly you and the ocean with nothing in the way. There's absolutely the end of vanity. Is that, is that actually how it feels? Yeah, well, I, I, so no, the line non-dual choiceless awareness came from my mum, who shared it with me when I was about 10 years old. <laughs> Um, he's big into philosophy and it, it's a, it comes from Ken, philosopher Ken Wilber's work um, he from his book Brief History of Everything um, but it was so I've travelled a lot with mum to surfing contests and competing since I was eight years of age all the way to uh, maybe a handful of years ago and she would over all those years of course be able to sense or witness the moment when she, she, she how she would describe it is that before I would enter the water as I was entering the sea. She'd almost know, not know whether I would win or not, but could tell from the energy I was going into the sea with well, how well it would go or not for me. And I think it was it would go really well for me when I dropped into non-dual choiceless awareness. So when there wasn't that duality between you know myself as a performer needing to perform to this criteria um, as you do in a surf contest um, and it's all, all structured to actually sort of let go all of that and even the notion of, of outcomes and the, the non-duality was when there was you know not even a, a sense of who I was or what I wanted but just again that dance with the wave um, and it's choiceless because it just happens in the moment. I'm not. I'm not directing it. Um, and in fact, often it's the wave that's setting the tempo. Uh, but there's total awareness in in that moment of presence. Um, so that's how kind of it all comes together. And so it's it's interesting again a very feminine kind of force, isn't it, of the letting go and how difficult that can be of this need to hold on to a a desired outcome even. Yeah. Which is a competitive surfer, it brought up all kinds of tensions. <laughs> well, that's very interesting because it, one of the things that struck me in the book um, was you were doing stuff which would have terrified probably 95% of the people watching um, this evening. 
Yet you never used any of the stereotypical male language at all, which is normally associated with something brave and outdoors. You never were doing battle or meeting challenges or conquering. Is that because you don't feel it like that at all? I mean, I'm rather hoping the answer would be, why would I? But I mean, it, it, it's, I was struck by the fact you didn't use any of that language. Yeah, I, I, I'm s it's so interesting that you noticed that um, even. But I, I do think there was, I mean, in my part, the intention with my creative work and the writing and, and in my films, like A Lunar Cycle, is I really wanted to capture something off the like not just the female perspective. I, I think that's really important too, because it's so underrepresented in that space of surf media in particular, but the feminine perspective. And by that, I mean, you know, surfing is this feminine experience, whether you're male or female, you know, to kind of bust or reveal that illusion of the dominance and control over narrative. Um, and, and I think surfing is that more feminine force as in the, about the, self-connection, presence, surrender, letting go. Um, it's really not a new concept either. Um, I think it's actually deeply embedded in the origins of surfing. If you go back to you know, the indigenous um, Polynesian culture and Hawaiian culture, where surfing's been there, I mean, in Hawaii since the fourth century. Um, and I just read recently this great book by um, Lauren Hill on, on women surfing. So again, kind of reclaiming some of our history or her story. <laughs> that in Hawaii, surfing was really celebrated as a part of life, you know, and um, to the point where uh, during the surf season, which was like three months, there was no work and no war allowed. <laughs> So recognizing, you know, that it's, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. can we go back to that, please? Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but also it was considered this form of like spiritual cleansing and, and woven into it too is, is not just the feminine, but the role of was women in it as well. And there's so many powerful mythologies around Hawaiian goddesses who were you know, healers and surfers. Um, and yeah, I just, there's one, one quote I had written down here. A line I really liked, and it reminded me to an experience I had surfing in another part of the world, which you might talk about, is, um, yeah, this ancient Hawaiian saying, hei wahine ka kalani. Um, I'm probably saying that terribly, but hei wahine kalani, uh, which tr loosely translates as the chief was surfing as graceful as a woman. So, <laughs> and when I was growing up and competitive surfing, I was told I needed to surf, be more aggressive and surf like a man, you know, yeah. which is it's such a shame really, isn't it? Um, but Gosh. so, but in your book, you talk beautifully about going to Hawaii with your mum and walking in the footsteps of your heroine who had just recently died. Do you want to talk through that? Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's just that recognition of the looking back, the importance of mentors, I think, for especially young girls. And for me, that was Rel Sun, this Hawaiian kind of surfing queen um, who I first discovered in a, a surf magazine I had a subscription to. Was the only way you could get information when you're about 11 years old and there's, you know, no Google. <laughs> um yeah, and just these images of her, again, embodying this gracefulness, uh, but also being such an all-round water woman, champion for um, kind of pushing for you know, women's rights within surfing and, and um, setting up the women's professional tour, uh, and yet just embodying the ocean and everything she did from like fishing and providing food for her family and, um, and then passing on her love of surfing through this kind of uh, embodiment of the aloha spirit, which is really this, this sense of like giving love. So if you, the sea has sort of filled you up with all this love and gratitude, then it's a responsibility to share it and, and give it back. So that was really struck by that. Um, and when then traveled with my mom when I was, um, so Rel died from cancer, age, breast cancer, age 47, um, and I, when I was about 12. Um, and then when I was yeah, 15, made the journey or pilgrimage, it felt like, with my mom to Rel's home place, birthplace in, in Makaha on the west side of Oahu. Um, yeah, which I was looking back now as a rite of passage as well as a young woman to have that kind of connection across time. And um, yeah, there's a lot of 
lot of stuff um, that came right. up from that. Right, so passage, because you talk again beautifully. Um, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Surf directly from her, but what, one thing that struck me when we talked about your book was, you know, the waves aren't crashing all the time. That's only in films. The oh real, yeah. The real life of the ocean is about the spaces in between. Uh, and I thought that was very poetic. Uh, but you then went on to describe that, which sounded a bit like Eric Clapton, uh, strangely, talking about it's the silences that make the notes stand out, you know, and it, there is something, yeah. something about that. Could you just talk about the spaces in between? Because it, w the context of it, if just to remind you, because when you write a book, you often forget. Uh, you've <laughs> You were talking about it in the light of the fact where you suddenly realized you had changed as a person while waiting for the best part of a day for the perfect wave. And I can't remember for the life of me, it was by the really big waves that you had pioneered surfing. Um, and you suddenly mm. realized that it was in your control. You didn't have to feel that you had to surf something. It just wasn't the right moment. And you were actually going to dare to just say, no, I didn't go back. It was all about yeah, yeah. independence. It, yeah, it's so interesting. So I was I think what I was also getting at the space in between um, in surfing is really interesting because of how surfing is portrayed. It's all action. It's all that peak moment of riding the wave, which only lasts a few seconds. And all the rest of the time, you're, you, you're hanging out in between the waves. Um, and in that context, with big wave surfing, it was also the, what's what gets celebrated is as the success and achievement is is catching and riding the wave, and obviously that's the peak feeling you're seeking <laughs> as a surfer. And yet, there are days where it happens and it doesn't align. You don't catch the wave, and and in in that particular session, I think it was it was at the cliffs of Moher incredibly intense powerful environment um one of the most probably critical waves in the world but just that feeling of initially a feeling like it was a whole mix of things there was this expectation to that I, I'd, it doesn't count basically um if you didn't get a wave and if it wasn't documented and yet there was so much i got from that experience of just being in in that space in between uh, of not riding the wave um, but it was very difficult at the time because I felt like I'd failed, you know, because I didn't get a wave and there was the expectation or pressure to step up to that image, um, either that I held of myself or of how other people saw me of being a big wave surfer. And you're only a big wave surfer, depending on what your last, how big your last wave was. Um, but the other thing I wonder about as well, and, and in the work I've done with women and connecting with our bodies through, th through water and, and the cross-cultural work I've done as well, which you might talk about, but is this how we're also conditioned differently like from from the get go, and I was thinking about this last night after we spoke as well about surfing being so closely connected to movement, to my body, to my own self expression. Um, but how women were conditioned to move in the world in a certain way that really is often can lead to us contracting and kind of withdrawing or making ourselves smaller, almost invisible. And and part of that is connected to the need to be safe, you know, um, um, for to safety, but when it gets conditioned in us, then we, it becomes really difficult to like to actually take those moments and opportunities to expand. <laughs> um, and I wonder, is that part of my process uh, with what was happening with big wave surfing as well? Um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, moving, moving on, I, I mean, I, I, I've got to move you on because I think we can. Okay. <laughs> No, I mean, last night we were talking about um, uh, where we start. We were talking about Melinda Gates's uh, book, The Moment of Lift, mm. and um, you gave it this sort of strap line about when women and girls uh, truly become independent because they author their own self image and it's their own self image, which is a bit what you're talking about in terms of great yeah. constraints of um, a big way of serving. I mean, I think it's. Uh, the, the reason it interests me so much, I guess, is because my partner and I talk about this, the way that we have um, a male-dominated world, and yet many of the very best things in the world seem to be run by or have the female 
running through the whole experience like Brighton through rock. I mean, we joked last night about some of the most civilized countries in the world at the moment seem to be run by women. Um, but I, I don't want to labor that point actually, uh, because what, what it really struck me was, uh, well, I'll start by asking you about how you came to be in Iran, how you came to change a culture to a sport. And then what I'd like to do, if you could just remind me, just in case I forget, um, is about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, and the extraordinary thing, I mean, I've got it here with me just as a reminder from Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, about the most yeah. complicated man ever proposed to reverse global warming. And actually, unbelievably, the second most powerful vector in all of it is the education and empowerment of women. Number one, if anybody listening, is actually changing the food systems. Number two is the education and empowerment of women. That is an absolutely monstrous, big thing, isn't it? And so, just to keep you on on on, on spot, I want you to talk mm. about how you came to be in Iran, for those who don't know, because many people won't know here tonight, what you did, what happened, and how cool was that? <laughs> Oh dear, okay, a very condensed version. For the extended version, check out the book in 2021. <laughs> uh, no, okay, so it, it's a 10 year journey, really. 2010 was the first year I went to Iran. Um, I, you know, was in, in my sort of professional surfing career at the time and competing, uh, getting I, disillusioned with the. I suppose how limiting I felt that was and what my real desire was, was to go and travel and experience new places and cultures and expand my own, um, I suppose, understanding and sense of self, but in particular to better understand what the, what, um, how other women and girls experienced um, some, or were able to experience something like surfing in different parts of the world. And, um, and I guess feeling the, yeah, so, no, the initial motivation really in 2010 was just that sense of uh, maybe the almost the naive sense of adventure and that privilege of being, being able to go and explore <laughs> somewhere. And then somewhere like Iran, when it came up as an idea that got thrown around, um, it's really not known as a surf destination, although that's changing somewhat. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and and showing up there uh, with Marion Poiseau, a French filmmaker, she has tiny little you know camera. I had my pink surfboard, and uh, we caught some you know recorded some clips surfing in the edge of the desert next to the border of Pakistan, which is where the um, coastline is more exposed to ocean swells. And and it was really quite a short trip. Um, didn't really get very under the skin of the place at all, but I did surf um, kind of completely covered. Um, more or less, and you know, a head covering and and a whole mismatch of clothes to try to stay as covered as possible. And in public spaces in Iran, women have to be covered. Um, but interestingly enough, what it did and it shows the power of maybe social media and things at the time off of YouTube. There's a really interesting urban youth culture in Iran. A lot of women snowboard and skateboard, which I didn't know, and they came across the the film, the, sh the short clip on YouTube. Marion posted um, a couple of years later, and it kind of all snowballed into this journey where I've been going back. We went back in 2013 to document basically this moment in surf history for Iran that was initiated by women, uh, Iranian and sports women were some of the first surfers in their country and that captures this that moment of, of surfing kind of really being initiated there um, and then since then it's been evolving through me going back kind of over the years to do different uh, workshops and, and work with other women like Shireen Garami Iran's first female triathlete and I um, came up with what we call the Be Like Water program um, and for me that's where everything really shifted in my relationship with surfing in the sea to see its uh, its uh, potential as a, as a tool or mechanism or medium rather than being the actual outcome. You know, it wasn't about learning how to surf. It was about how could it help us better celebrate the beauty and our differences through this amazing, playful, shared experience that was bringing together such a diverse mix of people. And then as women to really experiencing being immersed in water for the first time as a way to really connect with our bodies that build confidence and then ultimately led to this more trusting relationship and, and with, with the sea that was very, um, very powerful to witness. Um, so yeah, it's, it, 
it for me then also tapped into what I'm now researching, which was, you know, this power of listening through all of our senses, through, the, you know, of, of what happens when you do create a safe space for women to come together, um, the bringing the playfulness back into it rather than the performative aspects of taking pressure out and, and then how that lends itself to just just creativity as well and and realizing the importance of that in in my own work and so yeah basically what I'm saying is it led (laughs) to so many different things by very simply initially just like hey let's get all get in water and um and have a you know play in the surf um and what was interesting for me having Shireen who's not a surfer she really helped me take a step back and see that it wasn't about surfing and take the surfboard out of the mix initially and was like hey you know it's a bit overwhelming when you you know add all these elements in for the first time like what was it like for you when you first started to surf and for me surfing was just again this way that allowed me to get to the beach to play and get to know waves and get to understand the environment and feel my body find its balance for example so we stripped it right back and realized it was about yeah just that simple power of connecting with our body and breath and water and brought women into um, a swimming pool initially um and, it, you know, through very, very simple actions, it became quite a transformative experience, which led me to sort of write about it in the context of what happens if we could self-author our own image rather than having to conform to all these other images of all these different ways we're supposed to show up as women <laughs> or, or humans. Yeah, it's amazing that you ended up, I mean, Iran now has an Olympic surf team. Well, they're definitely, they're, they're, Gung ho on it, anyways. Yeah, fair play. Um, and I, I'm in touch with them on on the weekly, you know, with updates. And they've established the local the Baluch community or an ethnic minority in their fishing community. I fully embraced it and have set up a surf club and the kids kids they have a program and kids go surfing every day. One of the women I first taught to surf is instrumental in the organizing of it and she's really great at getting these scholarships for other up and coming um, young girls through the International Surfing Association. It's yeah, never could have foreseen that. <laughs> so, that's fantastic. Just, yeah, yeah. I, I think before we allow Rose to come in, I have to just go tell the audience that. Uh, how delighted you are that you uh, have agreed to become Eden's oh, yeah. <laughs> Marine Ambassador. And it went public, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday. Uh, and we're really thrilled with it. And I, I think anybody who's an Edenite or, or uh, is a, a sympathetic fellow traveller, hearing you talk, they must surely understand that the dimension that is added to us by all of the things you've said is really, really powerful and I look forward very much also because we're, we're hoping you're going to have a formal role with us in Derry Londonderry with the project there on the River Foyle which I don't think we've got time to talk about tonight because I think there's an awful lot of questions uh, suffice to say that everybody at Eden is absolutely thrilled to have you as one of the Eden team and thank you for being such a wonderful uh, um, person to interview tonight I've got two pages of notes I haven't even dared to ask you about yet but we'll have to have <laughs> We'll just do it again. Yeah. <laughs> what a pleasure. Um, Rose, I can see you appearing at the bottom. And- Hello. Hi. Thank you. I'm so sorry to interrupt because it has just been really lovely to listen to you both talking. Um, and I feel rude popping in, but we've had so many questions and I feel like it would be lovely to, to uh, at least ask a few of them. Um, and just off the back of the um, London, uh, the Derry London Derry project that you mentioned um obviously on the banks of the foil we've had a great question which is about obviously you know access to the sea is undoubtedly fantastic but not everyone has access to the sea so do you think that proximity to rivers also has a similar therapeutic benefit Mm, that's such a great question um yeah and there's really interesting research looking at all water bodies and then the differences between them and there's certainly evidence to support that you know for you know rivers lakes um and so on all have a benefit being you know we don't even have to be in them but being by them as well um for lots of different reasons and you know to do with the movement and the sound um and the other therapeutic qualities so absolutely um i i would say and it's all all connected but then the other thing I think that question raises is, is the kind of, you know, it's a paradox when we talk about a connection with water and it can be healing. 
uh, it can also be traumatic. Um, it can also <laughs> mean different things for different people. Um, and I think it's a how when I'm looking at how do we restore our relationship with the environment, it's also needing to look at those those things, the stories we hold around these places. Sometimes can be actually really negative. And and in rivers as well, and, and, and especially in the context of dairy, London dairy, they can be sites of, of loss and the same with the sea and depending on um, our, you know, our own history with, with, with water. Uh, so it's, uh, I just find that all very, very rich and I'm excited about the project in, in, on the foil as well because I think it brings in a lot of that diversity and creativity to mm. open up um, our relationship with nature in a really exciting and creative way. Mm. But yes, get get to water, any body of water. And actually simply looking at water has a, <laughs> a positive effect on the minds. There are great advancements in neuroscience as well. How It's like the color and movement of water can alter our brain waves and put us in a more meditative state. So any dose of water is good, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it was very uh, funny that our mutual friend who introduced us to, to hmm. each other, Mike, Mike, Professor Mike De Pledge, he told me of an experiment. I'm not even... well, dear, Tim's frozen for me. I'm sure he's frozen for a few of you as, as well. Um, we'll have to get to Mike De Pledge's story shortly. Tim, if you can hear me, uh, we'll welcome you back shortly if you, you might want to restart. Um, or leave and then join again. Um, I've got a question for Eski whilst we wait for Tim to come back. Um, so we've got this is a question from Kathy. Um, can she ask how can women who love water and understand the connection with blue spaces for our positive mental health be leaders in their own communities? How do you lead the way, and, and what does that look like, particularly in a small coastal community? Quite a loaded question there. So lots to answer, I think. Mm, yeah, great question. Mm. Um, and it's so interesting. There's this something of a revival of a relationship with water in certainly Ireland and the UK and, and Western world. Um, and a lot of the stories coming out in particular, I'm, I'm thinking of, okay, there's, there's surfing, but also with swimming. Um, there's just so many great um, writings and books happening around women's, women's experiences of swimming and groups of women kind of getting, getting together. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's it's a great way, great thing to share. Um, mm. And I know like, the likes of you know in Ireland is it um, the Rise Fierce hashtag that Sophie Hellier and others were a part of like kind of kicking off too to encourage women to kind of get together and through mutual support and and madness to like jump into the, the cold sea. Mm. <laughs> I think it just just starts with. Uh, just just doing it doesn't it um and and getting a few few of your mates along but in particular I think it's very supportive um as a group of women to do yeah mm, excellent um yeah and the other thing on that there is more increasingly more initiatives again getting back to how our experience of our bodies and water and these environments are are different they're gendered they're also influenced by our obviously race ethnicity and so on mm -hmm. um so around the world there are initiatives looking to address that and women are women and girls are often more vulnerable in particular when it comes to water water safety access to skills like swimming um for example, with the tsunami in 2004, uh, disproportionately more women and girls uh, drowned than, than men. And there's initiatives then like Sea Sisters in Sri Lanka are doing incredible work to help, um, I guess, restore the ocean as a safe space and empower women and girls with water safety uh, skills. Oh, yeah. That's that's really important. And, it, you know, because it is very true that there is not, I mean, the ocean should be for all, but it's not. Um, mm. And there's a lot of work to do there. Excellent. Tim, I'm welcome really back. Sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm back. Oh, you're on your phone. We oh, can dear. hear you and we can see you. Well, this we can see so your face. I, hope, I mean, I knew, I knew I was surplus to requirements anyway, but I didn't need to prove it quite so. It's <laughs> hard to do that. I no, think I'm I might be doing my best to cover in the same way that you did with um, when we lost uh, John temporarily oh, oh we've got well, oh. now. so okay. even, uh, <laughs> okay. I um, do apologize for my unintended rudeness that's uh, no problem I've muted the other one don't worry about that Tim um, we were just uh, she, 
did a, a wonderful uh, question and answer um, for Eastkey. I think we've got time for just one more question, unfortunately. Oh, wow, it's oh, flown by. It, is re- <laughs> it has really flown by. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, again, another question for, for Eastkey. Um, in reference to everything going on in the world right now, can you describe the significance of a paddle out? And the, um, obviously, there's been so many of those in the in the last few weeks. They've had a great significance. Oh, yeah. But for, for people yeah. who, who might not necessarily understand that, um, could you help describe that a bit better for us? Brilliant, brilliant question. Thanks um, for asking. Um, yeah, so this this paddle out uh, surfing in solidarity initiated by Black Girls uh, Black Girls Surf in in the states in America taps into I guess this kind of ritual in surfing of paddling out together as a community and, and, and forming a circle in the water uh, I guess being connected through water um, as um, as a action of solidarity in the Black Lives Matter movement. I think it's just hugely important because it's been a, it's a massive gap in the research I do um, in in creating you know better access to experience something like like the sea for therapeutic benefit and in surfing um, is that it can also be really exclusive. It's a very white space, a white privileged space, and and this is this is a really important movement um, because I, I read also a great article by Mary, Mary Annalise Hegler. Um, to go, definitely go check out her writing, but she just wrote an article um, in response to World Ocean Day as a, as a black person and how she, you know, she highlighted that for, for black people, for example, like beaches in the sea are sites of historically sites of violence, off, off the wait-ins, off slave ships. And that actually... You know, her experience is she's only had like one generation of being able to access the beach, you know, and I think I've had this, you know, generational connection of this with the sea through surfing. And yet black people in, in an American context, they have actually done, you know, fought for access to nature and integrated beaches. Um, and, and yet there is a deep trauma associated with the ocean and our, our relationship with it. And this, the paddle outs, I think, are a really important way of starting to initiate and go deeper into that work of, of unpacking our relationship with our environment. Mm. Uh, and each other crucially uh, so it, it just shows how cross-cutting again I think these issues are like we can't mm. look at climate change civil rights movement social justice separately at all um, mm. yeah mm-hmm. excellent thank you I think that's that's all we have time for really in terms of questions so I'll hand back to, to you Tim uh, just for some closing remarks if you'd like well Iski it was effortless having a conversation with you <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody else enjoyed it as, as much as I did. And uh, the one advantage I have over just about everybody else watching is that we're going to have the pleasure of working together uh, in the very near future. Uh, so all that remains is for me to wish uh, that your beer is suitably cold in the stream. Outside. It's, it's getting uh, quite warm in the caravan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. The caravan's not very forgiving temperature-wise. Yeah. You continue to stay safe and, and healthy uh, where you are until we all meet again when the plague dogs have left our door. Um, and I look forward very much to your influence on Eden going forward. So with much love from everybody in the audience and us, goodbye. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, I thoroughly you. enjoyed it. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Tim and Iski, for your time. And thank you, everyone who's joined us, whether on Zoom or on Facebook Live, uh, for joining us. We've had some, like I said, really great questions, especially just towards the end. And I'm so sorry we ran out of time and we might not have had a chance to ask yours. Um, we're working on lining up some more guests and hopefully we'll see you again soon for another edition of Tim's Kitchen Table Conversations. <laughs> um, and some good news that obviously Eden has been able to start reopening, which is wonderful. If you've been able to visit us, say, then you know that's wonderful and hopefully we'll get a chance to see you soon obviously we remain partially closed and the impact of that closure has been significant and if you're a supporter a member or a patron I just want to thank you so much for your continued support we're very very grateful for you Um, and if you are able to help us during these difficult times you can support us by joining by making a gift at edenproject.com forward slash donate and um, we look forward to seeing you very soon thank you very much everyone bye enjoy your beer and your wine (laughs) Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.